All right, everybody, welcome back again to another fantastic episode of Bears Guide 205. Today, we're talking about cultural ecology and globalization. Fun words. So, basically, by the end of this, the, the biggest takeaway you have to understand is what is this concept of globalization and how does it lead to us being more connected? So starting off, let's look at cultural ecology, but before we can even know what cultural ecology is, you probably have to know what culture is. Now you've been talking about this forever at this point. We should know that culture is the knowledge, the traits, the attitudes, the behaviors, the material uh, focus, like whatever it is about culture. It is a reflection of a group of people from beha behaviors, attitudes, uh, material possessions, uh, religion, language, anything. So we know that the study of these humans and the environments interacting is called cultural ecology. Now, there are two theories behind cultural ecology. There's an older theory and there's a newer theory. One, the older theory is environmental determinism, that the human behavior is strongly affected by its physical environment. In fact, that the environment determines social development, whether there is social development or there's not social development. The second, newer theory, is environmental possibilism. The physical environment may limit some human actions, but people have the ability to adjust to their environment. So the environment doesn't determine how much you develop socially, uh, forward or backward. It's that anybody can develop because we can all manipulate the environment. These are our two different types, and we're going to go in more in detail soon. So what does cultural ecology look like? Well, when we looked at where people have settled throughout the world, uh, when we talk about the starts of civilization and we talk about you know the start of agriculture and population growth and eventually migration to societies forming and blah, 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 we have to go back to the beginning and figure out, well, where the heck did people live? And when we talk about these things, we think about climate, vegetation, soil, landforms. It doesn't take a genius to understand what humans really wanted when we study or think about cultural ecology. And when geographers look back on that, it's pretty easy to figure out. Humans, climate-wise, want comfortable. Vegetation, we would like to have that because eating's good. Soil, oh, having good soil that can grow crops so we can have food is generally preferred. And landforms, we prefer flatter land. It's easier to live in a flat field than it is on the side of a mountain. But the thing is that this isn't true for the entire Earth. We understand that the Earth has tons of different environments that aren't always suitable to human living. And that's where the theories behind cultural ecology, the environmental determinism and possibilism come into play. So humans are given whatever they got, wherever they were on the planet, um, if they didn't move. And as I said, we have discussed, uh, geographers have discussed in the past, how civilizations and societies have advanced, and these are the two ideas. So with you, I want to go over and I want you to think about, is this environmental determinism or possibilism? And here it says, Huntington's early 1900s theory stated that economic development in a country can be predicted based on its distance from the equator. He said temperate climates with short growing seasons stimulate achievement, economic growth, and efficiency. The ease of growing things in the tropics, on the other hand, hindered their advancement. Now I want you to take a quick break, pause the video, and think to yourself, does this sound like determinism or possibilism? All right, now that you've paused it and you've come back, so let's talk about it. This is environmental determinism. How far away from you are the equator depends on how much you advance. So this guy is saying that societies that lived far north of the equator, that lived in temperate climates, cold climates, where they didn't have a long time to grow food, um, this this um, barrier by the environment forced them to achieve more and advance more. And then saying that, well, civilizations that are near the equator, because the environment isn't creating these barriers for them to overcome, the people never advance. Now, I don't know about you, but um, that's a little racist. And let's talk about why, because we know how melanin works and like skin color has developed over millions of years um there's a trend of uh certain skin color patterns for northern civilizations versus ones near the equator 
and dismissing all civilizations near the equator as if they have never progressed because of their tropical climate basically ignores all the incredible civilizations throughout history near the equator. So we don't like this one. We're not a fan of this theory. This is no bueno. Moving on, uh, the fill in the blanks here. Basically, the determinist theory uh, popularity began to decline in the 1920s as its claims were often found to be wrong. In addition, critics claimed it was racist and perpetuated imperialism. We'll talk about the word perpetuated eventually in imperialism. But by the 1950s, we're replacing it with possibilism, right? Now we are saying that people can over and we like that a lot more. This is definitely the possibilism when people are the decision makers and the modifiers, not the slaves to environmental forces. That's right. While some civilizations did have it harder and other ones definitely have it easier, uh, the environment does not determine the end goal for civilization. We humans do, right? And we will adapt to any type of environment to live there. All right, let's move on to globalization. Globalization is a fun word. We're going to talk about it a lot in this class, and you're probably going to talk about it a lot in your life. It's coming up a lot in politics recently, too. Globalization is the expansion of economic, political, and cultural processes to the point that they become global in scale and impact. So that just means that we, and, and I say we because I am referring to Western culture, the United States and Europe, um, in this globalization, we are expanding our economy throughout the world. Politics, our politics is all throughout the world. Our culture is all throughout the world, as you can see in this little graphic. And that is the way the world is moving, whether we like it or not. Um, so we're going to talk about the impacts of this globalization and what it looks like and, and, and throughout the whole course. So don't feel pressured to understand all of it now because this is a topic we are constantly going to come back to and analyze and think about the goods and bads. But one thing we know is that it leads to specialization at the local level. What that means is that people, we're going to try and hold on to what makes us unique, culturally especially. And when globalization is occurring and it's changing everybody into essentially the same type of people, um, people hold on to their culture and they, and they will focus on specialization and economic aspects of that uh, culture, uh, cultural or specific cultural aspects of that culture. I know that was super repetitive, but um, anyway, we'll, we'll get more into it later. But to give you an idea, an example of globalization, uh, most of the products that we use or wear or interact with every day uh, were made from different pieces all around the world, not just one place. And in fact, there's this fun little breakdown of genes and all the countries that they went to or had resources from before it got to you. And that can be the same with any product uh, that's been built anywhere in the last, I don't know, decade or two, because we've just been moving stuff all around the world. And we ask ourselves, is it good? And globalization is so much more than just trade. And this is such a basic breakdown. But I mean, this is just the beginning. And it's confusing because there are pros, there are cons. And it's hard to decide, you know, is it good or bad? And I love thinking about this stuff. I wanted to introduce this to you because this is stuff we're going to be thinking about all year, the goods and bads of things, and having these conversations to understand the material. Because I think it's more fun to think about this stuff and it's examples of it instead of simply just, you know, memorizing it. So what do you need to know today? Well, first off, there was a lot of vocab in this lesson. So make sure you got a handle on your vocab. What is culture? What's cultural ecology? What's environmental determinism and possibilism? And then finally, well, not finally, but how did we switch from determinism to possibilism? Understand both of those theories and why we switched. And then how does globalization connect all of us, right? And you could talk about all the different ways that globalization connects us. You could talk about it through money, you could talk about it through communication, you could talk about it through travel, you could talk about it through culture. You have so many different aspects here and once you start thinking about it, it just never stops. Now if you have any questions, as always, you can leave a comment and if you could, for me, hit that like button, smash subscribe so you know when new videos are released. As always, this is Bear's Guide to a 5 and I'll see you next time.